It's good to be with you this morning, church. It's good to be singing about our God and who He is and what He's done. Amen? Our only appropriate response is awe and amazement, just like we sang about in several of those songs. Well, hey, I'm excited to crack open the Old Testament with you guys today to get into the book of Micah. You guys excited about that? You ready to get in God's Word? Um, glad to be with you this morning. If there's anyone who's new, welcome. My name is Nick Lees, and I serve as the senior pastor here at Harvest. And uh, we are starting a new study today, a study through the book of Micah called Faithful God, Unfaithful People. And I, I'll just tell you, as I was studying uh, this book this week in preparation for this sermon, uh, there were points in my week where I was just openly weeping in my office as I was reading about it. Because I just saw how fitting it is for this season of our church and this season of our nation's history. And you may say, well, what in the world is that about? Well, I'm going to give you some context this morning to the book of Micah that will hopefully begin to help you connect the dots. But uh, it's just so cool to see how God has lined this up for us. Because we planned the sermon series in advance. So 2020 was planned back at the fall of 2019. So the fact that we're studying Micah right now is really God's providence And I'm excited to just kind of walk through why that might be a big deal. Because you may say, why is he so excited about Micah? You know, I struggle to get excited about the Old Testament. Maybe that's what you would say. Well, I'm going to show you why you should be excited. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and uh, turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Micah, which is page 660 of the Bible that you got when you came in. And go ahead and turn to chapter 1. And what I'm going to do, as I try to do whenever we start a new sermon series, is I'm going to give you a lot of the context of what we're going to study for the next six, seven weeks. And so don't worry about the blanks. We'll get to those at some point. But um, here's what we want to do. We want to start with verse one. So if you've got the Micah, book of Micah open, look at verse one with me. And I'm going to read this and then we're going to unpack it. There's a lot here. Micah writes, it says, the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morasheh in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. Let's stop there and just kind of walk through uh, what this one little verse to introduce the book really gives us to consider. So it starts with the word of the Lord. And that's really important because what we're about to read today and what we're about to study in the weeks ahead is not just a historical accounting, although it certainly is that. It is so much more. The words that Micah are preaching are the words of the Lord. They're from God himself. Micah is a prophet speaking on behalf of God. And just a couple chapters into the book, in chapter 3, verse 8, Micah says this, But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might, to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Micah's a prophet. He's been called by God to confront God's people on their sin. I think, I'd hope you'd agree that when God speaks, it's wise for us to listen. I really appreciate how commentator Bruce Walkie puts it. He says, our shoes should be off our feet as we hear this word. Right? We are, we're entering holy ground as we study the word of the Lord today. All right, so this is the word of the Lord, but it's the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Morasheh. And so this word came to a specific person by the name of Micah, who is from the town of Morasheth. Now, that's a small agricultural community about 22 miles southwest of Jerusalem. So uh, we got a little map here. And if you look down at the bottom corner of the map, you'll see Morasheth Gath. That's the town that Micah came from. It's not a big town. It's not the big city like Jerusalem was. It was a smaller farming town. And Micah is relatively unknown before this. In fact, uh, during Micah's lifetime, there was another prophet who's a lot more famous by the name of Isaiah, who was also out there prophesying, and he was declaring great things as well. But we know for a fact that God uses Micah's preaching to convict King Hezekiah of Judah. And through that preaching, King Hezekiah recognizes his sin, he recognizes the sin of the nation of, of Judah, and he repents. And God delays in judgment because of that. And we actually read about that in Jeremiah chapter 26. So this is later in life, after Micah has gone. Here's what happens in Jeremiah's day. It says, And certain elders of the land arose and spoke to all the assembled people, saying, Micah of Morasheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and said to all the people of Judah, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. 
and the mountain of the house, a wooded height. It goes on. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and entreat the favor of the Lord? And did not the Lord relent of the disaster that he had pronounced against them? But we are about to bring great disaster upon ourselves. So these are the the leaders of Israel a little bit later, the leaders of Judah a little bit later in history, and they're looking back and they're saying, hey, remember when Micah was preaching and King Hezekiah listened to him and actually repented and it went well with them? We should do that. Let's not keep walking in folly and sin. And so even though Micah's not well known prior to his ministry, God uses him powerfully. So it's the word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. That's helpful because it tells us where in history this happened, because we know the years of these kings rule and reign. And so let's take a peek at those. So first we've got Jotham. Uh, He reigned from 751 to 735 BC. And when he passed away, then his son took the throne, King Ahaz. So King Ahaz ruled from 735 to 715 BC. And then when Ahaz passed away, his son, King Hezekiah, took the throne. And he ruled from 715 to 686 BC. And so that's the timing of when Micah was walking the earth and was prophesying in the Lord's name. That's really helpful for us to know that. And we're going to get to why that's helpful in a minute. Because the last part of this verse, he says, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So the content of the word of the Lord that God has given Micah is for Samaria and Jerusalem. These are the capital cities. Samaria was the capital city of the nation of Israel to the north, and Jerusalem was the capital city of uh, Judah to the south. And again, uh, we got another map. So you see Judah, uh, Judah rather down to the south, and Jerusalem there on the right. And then if you go up to Israel, you'll see just above the, the big font of Israel is the capital of Samaria. And so Micah has received a word from the Lord for the capital cities because the leaders of the nation have gone astray. And the capital cities themselves have gone astray. And as the, as the leaders go, as the, the nation goes, right, their influence is leading the nations astray. It's indicative of the condition of the land. And so Micah pronounces judgment on them for their sinful rebellion against God, both the northern and the southern kingdom. They have abandoned the one true God, Yahweh, and turned aside to worship false gods and created idols. Now, if you're, if you're familiar with the really big picture of the Bible, then you know that God was, is making a people for himself, that he desires to have a people who will be faithful to him, and he will be faithful to them. He wants to be their God, and they will be his people. But unfortunately, as our sermon series title alludes, God upholds his end of the deal. God is faithful, but his people are unfaithful. And if we go back in history just a bit to when the nation of Israel was enslaved in Egypt, God met them where they were at, and he was faithful to rescue them and bring them out of Egypt. And as part of that process, as part of rescuing and redeeming them, God made a covenant with them. It's called the Mosaic Covenant. Do you know why it was called the Mosaic Covenant? Because he made it through the prophet Moses, right? He was interacting with Moses as the representative of the nation of Israel, And God was telling Moses, I will be your God, I will be faithful to you, and you will be my people, and you will be faithful to me. And as part of that covenant, God gave the Israelites the law, which was a very big set of instructions on, here's how you live as the righteous, faithful people of God. So the Israelites' job in that covenant agreement was to keep the law, to be faithful to God, to walk with him as they were called and created to do. And God would do his part. He would be faithful to them. He'd give them a land, the promised land. He would bless them in that land. He would raise them up. That's the thing, being his people, being their God. And at the foundation of the law was the Ten Commandments. And I just want to share with you how the Ten Commandments started. This is from Exodus chapter 20. It says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Right, as, as God is giving Moses and he's giving the nation of Israel this covenant, he reminds them of who he is and what he's already done for them. He is the faithful God, he is the rescuer, he's the redeemer, and he gives them some instructions, right? Don't have any other gods. And if that wasn't clear enough, he goes a bit further. Don't make any idols. Don't create anything that you will bow down to and worship either. Because God is a jealous God. He doesn't share his glory with another. He alone is worthy of your worship. If you know your history, what does the nation of Israel proceed to do time and time again? They turn away from the one true God and they worship idols. They bow down to the created things. In fact, even before Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, they've already started making the golden calf so they can bow down and worship it. Well, as you kind of move through the history of the Old Testament, through the historical narratives, what you see is time and again, uh, the Israelites continue to rebel against God. They don't worship him like they are called to do. And they have evil king after evil king after evil king who leads them to just follow the pagan nations around them. They look at what they're doing and they say, hey, that looks good, we'll, we'll follow that. We'll worship the Baals or the Asherah, which were the pagan deities of the Canaanites. And as the, nation, or as the leaders of the nation went astray, so too went the nation. And so let's look real quick at the three kings that we've already heard about, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. I just want to give you a brief snippet of what the Bible says about each of them. In 2 Kings 15, Here's what we hear about Jotham. It says, In the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramilah, king of Israel, Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jerusa, the son or the daughter of Zadok. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. Nevertheless, the high places were not removed the people still sacrificed and made offerings on the high places. And he built the gate of the upper house of the Lord. Now, that little report is overall decent, right? It says that Jotham did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but there is one glaring thing that's a problem. He didn't get rid of the high places. The high places were where the people of the land went to worship the pagan deities. And so the people still had access to worship these false gods, So that's going to be a big problem, not only for Jotham's reign, but also for those who come after him. His poor leadership is going to have consequences. Listen to what happens in the very next chapter in 2 Kings uh, chapter 16. Now we're talking about Ahaz. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remelia, Ahaz, the son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, his God, as his father David had done, but he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. He even burned his son as an offering, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. So this is a much different report, right? Ahaz is a wicked king. He's doing what's right in his own eyes, and he's leading the nation astray. He's looking to the example of the kings of, the, of, of Israel, the northern kingdom. They had already long ago gone astray. They had already abandoned Yahweh, and they were already in the process of being judged. And now Ahaz is saying, hey, I'll follow their lead. He begins to lead the nation like that. We hear that he sacrificed one of his children in pagan worship, right? That's disgusting. And if you were to keep reading in this chapter you would hear that Ahaz even made a deal with the king of Assyria. You see, Ahaz was in the southern kingdom, right? He's the king of Judah. And Israel and Syria have aligned against him. They're trying to pressure him to go to war with them against Assyria. And instead, uh, Ahaz decides, you know what? I'll just kind of make a deal with the devil, and I'll just go straight to Assyria myself, and I'll pay them to come and, and rid me of these people who are trying to invade my land. And so he does. And the king of Assyria gladly accepts their money. He comes in, and he repels the invasion, but at a great cost. Now Judah has to pay a tribute every year to Assyria. And King Ahaz actually takes one of the pagan altars and builds it, replicates it in Jerusalem, and begins worshiping false gods there. 
So he's a bad dude, a bad king who's leading the whole nation astray. Let's read now what happens when King Hezekiah comes on the scene in 2 Kings 18. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. According to all that David, his father, had done, he removed the high places, and he broke the pillars, and cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze servant, serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it, and he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments of the Lord that God commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him. Whenever he went out, he prospered. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory, from watchtower to fortified city. So King Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the wicked king, by God's grace, is a righteous king. This is a much better account, and there are certainly things that he doesn't do well, which if you read the scriptures, you'll hear about those, but he seeks to walk in the ways of the Lord. He seeks to help the people do the same, and he removes all of that uh, pagan worship. He tears down the high places, finally. He cuts apart the Asherah poles and the things that they had erected and had made idols out of. He starts to lead the, the kingdom back to the right way. And this comes because he, led, he, he listened to Micah. Micah's preaching to King Hezekiah is what God used to call him to repentance. And while, while uh, King Hezekiah was ruling, he got to see the Assyrians come in to the northern kingdom and take the Israelites away. He, they defeated and, and told him, hey, you're going into exile. King Hezekiah was there to see all of that. So let me keep reading. Here's, here's how that goes. It says, in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Syria, Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of the three years, he took it. And in the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God but transgressed his covenant. Even all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, they neither listened nor obeyed. So did you you hear what happened there? That the northern kingdom, the Israelites, did not listen or obey. They broke the covenant, and the result was the Assyrian army came in, conquered them, and took them to exile, just like God had said it would happen. And so the book of Micah, as we get into this book, he's alive and he's, he's prophesying during these days. So we're kind of like looking back in history, right, at these things. Micah's there in the middle of it. And as he's going around prophesying, he's seeing this happen before his very eyes. So he's, he's calling out to a nation that's in, in dire trouble. It's on the precipice of disaster. Their idolatry, their turning away from the one true God is ruining them. They were created to represent him. They were created to spread his righteousness across the land, but they're not doing that. Instead, they're corrupt. Their religious and civil leaders are are both wicked. We'll hear in the book of Micah how the prophets and the, the religious leaders, not Micah, but the others, would take money in order to give a good prophecy for those who gave it to them. We'll hear about how the civil leaders used their power and authority to oppress those who were in weaker positions. And so God has raised up Micah to call out in truth, to name and identify the sinful leaders and the prophets. But that's not all the book of Micah is about. It's not just a book of judgment. Also intermixed with that judgment is God's faithfulness, his character, his redemption. There are these glimmers throughout the book where where Micah says, or God speaks through Micah and says, I will redeem and rescue a remnant. I will bring a group back from exile. I will preserve you. 
God will be faithful to his covenant, even when his people are not. He will establish the nation of Israel. He will bless all the earth through them, even when they do their darndest to mess it up. And in fact, Micah prophesies about a future ruler, one who would come from the town of Bethlehem, who would rule in God's name and provide rescue and peace. Who could that be? Right? Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, born in Bethlehem many centuries later. That's amazing that God gives us these prophecies hundreds of years in advance. We're also going to hear Micah lament as he sees the destruction around him of his people, of his nation, of the people of God, as he, as he looks around and sees the spiritual depravity, and the brokenness, the division that's all around him. And he's going to speak for God in condemning the wicked. He's going to call God's people to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with their God. The way that Micah is preaching is he's calling for the people of God to Rise up to be transformed by God's righteousness and to allow that to bear good fruit. That's what God is after. And so I would argue that Micah's message is a message that we need desperately today. I don't know if you can make all the corollaries or not or if you've heard them. There's a lot of similarities between what's going on in those days and what's going on in our days. Now, we are not the nation of Israel, but God is still making a people for himself. It's called the church. And as we've been learning in the Gospel of Matthew this year, the church is called to be a people who are righteous and who are salt and light, spreading God's righteousness across the land. And so just like Israel, followers of Jesus Christ must forsake worshiping false idols. We cannot exchange the one true God for things created by our own hands. So just like Israel, you must put to death idolatry. And sure, you're probably not tempted to worship Baal or Asherah, right? Those aren't really around these days. But you're probably tempted to worship self or success or all sorts of other things that you look to to provide you with meaning and purpose and worth in life. Those are the things that we often elevate to the position of God these days. And so today, uh, we have a lot to learn about the problem of idolatry. So with the time we have left, this is where we're going to unpack three lessons from the idolatry of the Israelites. So now if you want to fill out your blanks, we're going to get to that, all right? Let's go back to the text in Micah, and let's keep reading. Because Micah is about to speak on behalf of God. Let's hear what he says in verses 2 through 5. It says this, Hear, you peoples, all of you. Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. And let the Lord God be a witness against you the Lord from his holy temple. Again, let's pause there for a second. God wants attention. Right, whose attention is he demanding and asking for in this passage? What does it say? It says, all of you, right? O earth, all that is in it. God is calling all people everywhere to listen up and to pay him heed. It's a reminder that God is not just the God of the Israelites or the Judeans. He is Lord over all. And God has a contention with the people of earth. The language in this verse is the language of a lawsuit. A lawsuit against humans. God is the witness. He's the prosecutor and he's the judge. He's the one who we're told reigns on high from his holy temple. So in comparison to us on the earth, he is all-powerful. If you look at the the verse there that says, let the Lord God be a witness against you, perhaps a better way to translate that would be, let the sovereign God be a witness against you. That's the the meaning of that text, is he is all-powerful, he is in control, and we are not. Let's keep reading in verses 3 and 4. He says, for behold, the Lord is coming out of his place, and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth, and the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. God is coming. He's coming, and even the greatest things on this earth cannot resist him or stand in his way. Not even the great mountains stand before him. God is intentionally speaking in a very powerful and evocative way. If uh, these things cannot stand, what man or woman can stand before God? And the answer is none, no one. What hope do the rulers of this earth who oppose God 
have? Like, what hope do they have of opposing him successfully? Absolutely none. Well, let's read about why he's coming. We see this in verse 5. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? What is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? God says, I'm coming because you have violated the covenant. Both the capital cities are rife with corruption. Their leadership is struggling with sin. They've worshipped false idols and, and created things that were never meant to be God. And now he's coming to hold them, hold them accountable for their choices. And so this brings us to our first lesson of the idolatry of Israel. God alone is worthy of worship. God alone is is worthy of worship. That is the testimony of Scripture from front to back. He is the creator. He is the one true God. And yet, just like the Israelites, you and I are tempted to worship other things. And maybe you say, wait, 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 how? Maybe you don't bow bow down to Baal or Asherah, but here are some things that it might look like in our day and age. When you live to be entertained, That's idolatry. When you turn to the creation, food, TV, whatever it is, insert the thing there, for comfort, that's idolatry. When you start looking at pornography or pursuing uh, sex in illicit ways, that's idolatry. When you look to the approval of others for your worth, that's idolatry. Those are acts of worship where you're exchanging the one true God for something else in this world to expect it to provide you with pleasure, comfort, ease, meaning, or worth. You're putting it where God is meant to be. Just like the Israelites, you and I are prone to look to other things to satisfy than God. And that was never meant to be. And we must, you must, I must repent for that. We must humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and say, God, I'm guilty, and I need to confess to you my idolatry. and I want to turn from it. God, I'm recognizing that I'm not turning to you and looking to you to satisfy me. I'm not looking to you to find my purpose and meaning in this life. I'm looking to other things to satisfy and to give me purpose and meaning. And we replace that with saying, you alone are worthy of worship. And worshiping you alone is the only truly joyful, meaningful way to live. That's what repentance looks like. That's what it sounds like. Your idols can't save you. None of them died for you. None of them can provide the ultimate satisfaction, joy, and purpose that you're looking to them to give you. Only the God of heaven and earth can do that. He alone is worthy of your worship. I know how tempting it can be to think, yeah, if I only had control of my day, if only I could have the comfort that I long for, if only I could have this certain pleasure at this moment in my life, then things would be fine. Then I would be happy. Then I would be content. But that way of thinking is idolatry. I'm in those moments saying, God, I know better than you. I could do better than you. If you just let me be in control, my life would be a whole lot better. That's exchanging the worship of the one true God for self. We put ourselves in God's place. Beloved, we have to flee from that. We have to run and pursue worship of him instead. Because it inevitably brings destruction into our lives. Listen to how God responds to Israel's idolatry in verses 6 and 7. It says, Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. And I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire. And all her idols I will lay waste. For from the fee of a prostitute she gathered them, and to the fee of a prostitute they shall return. Do you hear how that two verses starts? All right, look at the first word again. Therefore, It's because of what they have done. God says, now here are the consequences. A key concept from Scripture is that God sees everything. There's nothing that escapes his notice. And he holds his people accountable for their choices. 
And that's a valuable lesson for us as humans, right? Your choices have consequences. We teach that a lot in our household to our kiddos. But as adults, we need to remember that lesson too. My choices have consequences. Your choices have consequences. And when the holy God of the universe is involved, uh, those choices, if they're to rebel against him, have serious consequences. Which brings us to our second lesson from Israel's idolatry. God clearly explains the consequences of sin. God clearly explains the consequences of sin. Again, throughout the pages of Scripture, God had outlined to his people, here's what will happen if you obey, and here's what will happen if you disobey. They knew what would happen if they broke covenant with God. They knew that exile was the only option. That was not going to be a pretty experience, that a, a foreign nation would now rule over God's chosen people. They would lose the blessing and the protection of the Lord as they're disciplined by foreigners. And God speaks about that process right here in verses 6 and 7. Specifically, he's talking about Samaria in the northern kingdom of Israel at this point. And notice that he speaks in the first person. Right? So he is the one who's making Samaria a heap in the open country. He is the one who's bringing Assyria in to discipline the Israelites. God is in control. He is the sovereign one. Nothing happens that he has not allowed to happen, including the foreigners coming in and con- having victory and conquest over his people. Now, you might hear that and say, that's unloving. That's unfair. Let me give you pause for a moment if that's where you're thinking. You're forgetting when you say something like that that they've chosen these consequences. They knew what would happen if they broke covenant with God. God had made it very clear that this is a serious matter when he entered into the Mosaic covenant with them. Covenants are not made to be broken. And so when they chose to enter into it, they were agreeing to uphold their side of the covenant. And yet time and time again, Israel broke that covenant. They violated it. They turned aside. They treated their covenant partner with utter contempt and disgust. I mean, think about that. They're in relationship with the God of heaven and earth, and they say, you know what? Nope. I'm going to pursue this instead. I think this will satisfy. I think this will be better. And that's what they did. So as you're thinking about this and you're tempted to say, well, that's unloving. How's that fair? Instead of taking a stand against God and his discipline of his people, I would encourage you to say, how could they treat God like this? How could they turn their backs on the one true God? How unloving of them. God had been very patient with his people. They had been violating the covenant for hundreds of years, and he was delaying. He was sending prophets after prophet after prophet to say, repent, turn back to me. He gave them plenty of warnings, and yet they would not listen. Now, if you take this whole scenario and you change out the characters to now be a parent with their child, Would you say that a parent who lets their child continue to get away with sin and the the inevitable consequences of that sin, is that that a loving parent? Absolutely not, right? A good parent is going to bring discipline into the child's life to help them see this is not a good way to go. They're going to protect them. It's for their good. And God is a far better parent than any one of us. He knows when and how it's best to discipline. And so he does. The Israelites are responsible for the consequences of their sin. So are we. All right, let's not, let's not forget to apply this to our lives. We are also responsible for the consequences of our sin. I really appreciate this comment by Gary Smith in his commentary on this book. He says this, God is equally displeased when he witnesses sinful attitudes and rebellion against his revealed will and his people today. Sin is especially disturbing to God when it involves the worship of anything or anyone other than God alone. The act of bowing to our own ambitions, serving ourselves, putting ourselves first, and loving our desires more than God's is nothing less than a veiled denial of God's lordship and divinity. If we put anything before God, he will witness that fact and judgment will be forthcoming. We need to take those words to heart. We have things that we're tempted to make idols as well. We need to be aware of that. God has clearly given us the explanation of the consequences of sin. Again, all over the pages of Scripture, Old Testament and New. It's not pretty. 
It doesn't go well. One especially powerful passage is found in Hebrews chapter 10, where the author is speaking to those who have been around the church. They've, they've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've maybe even participated in the fellowship of the body of believers, but yet they have still not repented and believed in Christ. They're still choosing to live in sin. Here's what Hebrews 10, 26 to 31 says. It says, For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That is a freight train of a passage right there. And that ought to uh, really convict and challenge us. The, the thing here is if we choose to willingly live in sin after we've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, after we've had opportunities to repent and believe in him, that has tremendous consequences. Right? If that's you today, if you've been around the church, if you've heard the gospel, but you never repented and believed, you never made a break with sin and put your faith in Christ, what you're doing is you're mocking the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Because he has come down. The creator has entered his creation. He's made a way for you to be rescued and redeemed. It's possible to be adopted into the family of God, to be his son or his daughter. But if we choose to continue in sin, that makes a mockery of that sacrifice. And God says the judgment for that person is fearful indeed. So it kind of begs the question, aren't you thankful that you don't have to stay stuck in sin? That we don't have to keep walking down this path. God has made a way. Jesus has come down. He has made a way for us to repent of our sins and believe in him. That is the good news of the gospel. You can be freed from this death and instead have eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's a really good trade. And I want to plead with you if you're in the position where you don't know that you've made that decision, that you've acknowledged, I'm a sinner and I need a savior to make that decision, to wrestle with that today. None of us here are saying that we're perfect or that we don't sin, but we're saying that we know the one who has rescued and redeemed us. He's worthy of your worship. Now, for those who are in Christ, you've already acknowledged your need for a Savior. Are you continuing to live out that profession of your faith? Or are you in the position where you have started to slowly return to the old ways, the old man, the old woman, Please tell me that's not the case. Please tell me you're not going back to those things that you used to be living for and defined by. It's so easy for us as Christians to become complacent. It's so easy for us to be spiritually asleep, to to say effectively, that's good enough. I've grown enough. I'm, I'm holy enough. Those are dangerous words for a Christian. That's ignoring the the fact that we are in a war for holiness, that this is a daily battle that we cannot give up on. We have to keep fighting by God's grace and his strength. And I want to challenge us from how Micah responds to sin. Look at verses 8 and 9 here and listen to how he responds. He sees the sin of his people and he cannot stay silent. He says this, For this I will lament and wail. I will go stripped and naked. I will make lamentation like the jackals and mourning like the ostriches. For her wound is incurable. And it has come to Judah. It has reached the gate of my people, to Jerusalem. Micah's response to what he sees is lament. It's wailing. Uh, Literally, he stripped down to his loincloth and was walking around making this horrendous noise of, of distress. And he's doing that so that people will hear and so that his God will hear because he sees the sin of his people. He sees the brokenness of his land. And he is in turmoil. His heart is heavy. He sees the cancer of sin and its judgment is coming from the northern kingdom down to his kingdom, to Judah. Right? That's how he explains it. It's at Judah, the gate of his people. It's personal now. Right? He sees the march of the Assyrian army coming. 
and, it, and that did happen, all the way uh, to the gate of Jerusalem in 701 B.C. And so Micah is lamenting because the sin of his people has resulted in their judgment. Devastation is upon the land, and it's their fault. They knew better. They had the word of God, but they weren't willing to obey it. And they couldn't look around and say, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. They had no one else to blame but themselves. They needed to be humble and look inward. And Micah is broken over this. And his lament is captured in verses 10 through 16. He speaks very poetically to the cities that are going to be impacted by the Assyrian army's march. He says, don't talk about this in the Philistine city of Gath. Don't even weep a single tear in front of them. Why would he say that? Because he doesn't want the enemies of, of God to be able to gloat over Israel's downfall. And then he continues going through these other cities that are part of the nation of Judah. He tells Beth Aphra, which means house of dust. He says, roll yourselves in the dust. He says to the inhabitants of Shafir, which means beauty town, to walk in nakedness and shame. He takes each one of these cities' names and he uses it in this magnificent play on words to explain to them, here's the, the kind of response you ought to have. Here's how you should express your distress and your shame because the Assyrians are coming. A conqueror is coming, he says. The glory of Israel, meaning her leaders, are going to Adullam. It's a very clever play on, on history there. Uh, Adullam was where King David had to flee from King Saul when Saul was trying to kill him. Micah is saying, just like King David did so many years ago, our leaders are going to have to run. They're going to have to hide because Assyria is coming. Devastation is coming. The nation is going into exile. But the consequences of sin are tremendous. And so we can learn a lot from Micah's response. That's our third lesson from Israel's idolatry. It's you must choose the appropriate response. You must choose the appropriate response. And it's entirely appropriate to lament and to wail over the sin that you see in your own life and in the sin that you see in the lives of others. It's appropriate to wail and lament over the brokenness that we see in our nation and in our world. To lament over the sin of partiality that has been brought to our attention yet again in the murder of George Floyd. To lament over the sin of murder that happens daily through abortion, millions of lives being lost each year to lament over the hatred that we see and hear about on the news regularly as men and women kill, steal, and destroy from one another all across the world. No question this year has been replete with brokenness, which is why we're coming back here tonight at 3.30 to lament and pray together. And if you didn't know about that, you're invited. We'd love to have you back right here in this room at 3.30 p.m. as we just spend some time learning as a church how do we lament? I don't know that I've done a lot of lamenting in my life. It's time for us to talk about that and learn together and practice it together. So come back, and I hope, I hope you would. But you must choose. Right? You must choose to cry out to your great God for help. That is an appropriate response to who he is. He alone is worthy of your worship. And yet so many, so many, including Christians, do not give it to him. Instead, they turn aside and they worship self or they worship success or they worship something else in this creation. And they rob God of the glory due his name. You must also respond appropriately to sin in your life by confessing it and fleeing from it. Turn from the old ways of living. Turn to the Lord and say, God, I want to walk in your ways to walk out that righteousness that we've been hearing about in the Sermon on the Mount. That's what we're called to do. And you must also respond appropriately when God allows discipline into your life. Hebrews 12 tells us that God disciplines those whom he loves. Discipline is for your good. He's seeking to produce holiness in you, without which no one will see the Lord. And so don't despise God's discipline in your life. Don't get upset when your sin is exposed, when a brother or sister comes alongside of you and seeks to help you grow. Don't be upset when there are consequences for your sin. Rather, accept them. Learn from them. And say, Lord, I don't want to go down this path again. So humble me and help me to walk with you. 